worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning. Sing with us. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare. Judah. He's roaring with power and he's fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Thank you. 
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never failed me yet I know the night won't last
Though you've never failed Shall we pray? Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness to us. You are a faithful God. We have confidence in knowing that you are going to take care of our needs. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this time of worship that we can express to you our hearts through song. And Lord, would you speak to us now through your word and through your servant. Uh, may it land on soft hearts so that we can receive what you have to say to us this morning. We love you, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, yes, thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Woodlands. It's great to see you all today. Uh, welcome to everybody who's watching online. So glad that you've uh, tuned in via Facebook. Um, or if you're watching this later on our Woodlands Community Church channel on YouTube. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Woodlands. And I certainly want to welcome and greet each and every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because here at Woodlands, we're all about Jesus. Um, he is, uh, we believe him to be the Son of God who gave his life on the cross uh, that we celebrated last week during Easter and uh, was raised again from the dead. And uh, He is our Savior. When we believe in Him and receive Him as our Savior and follow Him, uh, then we have the guarantee of everlasting life with Jesus. So that's what we're all about. And if you'd like to, to have that sense of peace in your life, uh, man, I tell you what, you're in the right place, both here or online. Right now uh, in our service, we do what's called a generosity moment. And it's just a moment to uh, say thank you to God for all of His goodness, all of His grace. Now, if you're here for the first time watching uh, online or here in the house uh, first time, you're our guest, so know that you are our guest in every way. For those of us who call Woodlands home, we love the opportunity to support uh, the ministry here and to show our thankfulness and gratefulness to God through our giving of our finances. Now, you'll see we have three ways to give here at Woodlands up here on the screens uh, behind me, or it'll show up on your screen there at home. And uh, so any of those ways work. We also can uh, here at the, if you're here physically at Woodlands, we have two uh, black boxes uh, by the doors at the exit area where you can just drop your giving in those as you head out. I know, uh, so, so why do we give? What's the reason behind all that? Well, it really, uh, we see it all through scripture. Um, but I want to share one short scripture with you from Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, uh, beginning in verse 7, it says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body. Anybody here could use a little health to their body? Right? It begins by fearing the Lord and shunning evil. And it will bring nourishment to your bones. And then verse 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. And uh, some of you think, well, I'm not that wealthy. Well, you know what? Whatever we have is our wealth, is what it's talking about. With the first fruits of, your, of all your crops. You know, when this was written, it was an agricultural society. So money was actually counted in your crops. For us today, of course, it's more of a currency. So we look at honoring the Lord with our first fruits of our, of our wealth, of, of what we earn. We give Him the first part of it. And then, but look at the promise that comes with it. When you do that, when you honor God with the first part of what you've been given, listen what happens. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Wow. Again, an agricultural society, barns and, 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 and wine, those were signs of wealth. But think about it today. And I'm sure many of you are probably like me. When you go home and you open up your closet, probably more clothes in there than you know what to do with, right? Uh, you look at your shoes and it's like, you know, it'll take me a month to wear all these shoes. Uh, you know, and um, so uh, the Lord has truly been good to us. He has truly blessed us to overflowing. And we want to be sure that we're sharing uh, that with, with Him. Well, today um, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing a very, very special guest here at Woodlands Community Church. Um, part of uh, the partner, one of the partnerships that we have connected to at Woodlands is the Timothy Initiative. Uh, 
And as you all know, um, uh, we have uh, been giving financially to the Timothy Initiative because it's just an absolutely amazing organization. I, I, I don't want to talk too much because I want to give our guests time to speak, but I have never in my life, 41 years I've been a pastor, um, started when I was 10, um, <clears throat> wasn't really that funny, was it? <laughs> um, and, uh, but I have never, and I, I was a missions pastor for 10 years. I've traveled all over the world. There is no other organization I have more faith in to take the dollars that we send and use them in the most frugal and most effective way for making disciples. And David's going to talk more about that, but I'm just here to tell you uh, that I love this man. He is a great man of God. He's been faithful to the Lord, and I'll tell you what, the, the ministry that has been birthed out of David Nelms uh, is now a worldwide ministry, and uh, it's amazing what they're doing. And unlike some ministries that get large, and then all of a sudden you see the leaders uh, living in huge homes and driving fancy cars. No, he's still driving the old car he used to, still living in the old home he used to live in. Um, because they, they, these guys are so good about making sure every dollar goes toward reaching lost people and making disciples. That's what I believe. I believe that's what this Bible teaches, and that's what the Timothy Initiative practices. So, folks, I would like to ask you to put your hands together, Woodlands, and if you would, welcome my friend David Nelms. Oh, what a great honor to be here back with you guys. I, uh, I really count it an honor. We, I think this is my third time here, Daniel. And I tell you, I just love this place. You've got so much spirit. You're so alive. And your worship team, didn't they do a great job? It's an excellent job. And you've even got your own little uh, dancing team down here, too. They do a great job, too. That was worth coming this morning just to see that. Whether you like my sermon or not, that was worth coming for right there. Now, uh, I'm not from this area, but my wife grew up just, I guess, just south, maybe a little bit maybe a little bit east of you here, uh, Maryville, Indiana. Do you guys know where that is? That area down there, Crown Point, Maryville. So I've got some relatives, some uh, in-laws and a couple of outlaws too down in that part of the, uh, part of the uh, state of Indiana. But so glad to be with you. Daniel, I appreciate your comments on the, one of our core values is integrity matters to God, it matters to us too. We see, we see reporting to you what's happened with your dollars as an act of worship. We believe that God knows what's going on in heaven. I heard somebody say once, in heaven the pencils don't have erasers on them because you don't make mistakes up there. They know exactly what's happened with every dollar that you've given. And it's our, it's our goal that we get it exactly right and that, it's, that, that what you give, the money you give, is you're giving it to the Lord and the money that comes to us from you, we must be excellent stewards of that because it's not even your money, it's God's money. And I'm not going to waste a penny of your money, but I want to tell you something, I'm not about to waste any of his money, okay? I got to, you talk about that first star out with the fear of the Lord, and uh, I've got too much fear of God to do that. But yeah, you guys have become what we would call a major partner for TTI. You're just getting it done. And TTI stands for the Timothy Initiative. The Timothy Initiative. In fact, I would say this if we could get half the churches in the Chicagoland area to do what you're doing, we could literally finish the task of getting the gospel to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, literally in just the next two or three years. It would be that easy to do it. The manpower is there. The technology is there. The ability is there to do it. It's simply a matter of finding more partners like you guys. But what we do is we make disciple makers. We make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we do it primarily among what's called unreached people groups or unreached ethnicities. When Jesus said, go make disciples of every nation, he used the word ethne for nation. We get our English word ethnicity. There's a couple of hundred nations in the world, 
but there's like uh, 12,000 ethnicities. And a bunch of those ethnicities, people groups, are classified as unreached. That means very, very, very few of them actually know about Jesus and, and, or know Jesus, and in some cases, very, very, very few of them have even ever heard about Jesus Christ. And so what we do is we go into that part of the world. It's basically your Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and animist world, and which is primarily in Asia and Africa, primarily. And we go into little villages, and we lead people to Christ, and we disciple them to live like Jesus and to do the exact same thing, to go out and lead others to Christ and disciple them to live like Jesus and then do the same thing. So we make disciples who make disciples that end up planting churches that plant churches. Our little mantra is every, every believer a disciple, every disciple a disciple maker, every disciple maker's home a potential church, and every church a church planting training center. And so that's what we do. And we have figured out how to do it very inexpensively because we have removed from the church planting disciple making equation what I typically refer to as the three S's. And those three S's, these are not bad things, but they're just expensive things. Those three S's are salaries, sanctuaries, and seminaries. We have removed that from the equation. It's not that those things are bad. They're not bad at all. It's just that you don't have to have them to make disciples and to plant churches. We're able to remove the salaries by training tent makers. Paul in the New Testament was a tent maker. He was a businessman, and he was a pretty good church planter. And so that's what we do. We don't train people like me or Daniel. We don't train pastors. We train regular, normal people. And everybody knows pastors are not normal. Amen? So uh, I know I'm not. I mean, I'm a strange bird if you get to know me, okay? And so uh, we train regular people like you. By the way, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he wasn't giving it to ordained pastors. There were none. There was not an ordained pastor on the face of the earth when Jesus said, go make disciples of every nation. In fact, the church hadn't even been birthed yet. Matthew 28 comes way before Acts 2. And so he wasn't talking to people like me. He was talking to people like you. And so we, we get rid of the salaries by just training people. They have a little farm or they drive a taxi or they own a shop or they're some kind of a, maybe they're in the army. But we train regular people. That gets rid of the salaries. We don't build sanctuaries. We use our homes or an office or under a tree or a cave or a dried out riverbed or in an alley or on a rooftop. In many parts of the world that where we work, if you build a building, it's going to get blown up or burnt down anyway. And so it doesn't make much sense to burn it. And if, and if that doesn't happen, it does put a target on their backs. Everybody that walks in that place and walks out, they're targeted. And so we don't build buildings, and so you get rid of the salaries, and you get rid of the sanctuaries, and then you get rid of the seminaries, and we're not opposed to seminaries. Uh, uh, believe it or not, I've got four degrees. Uh, uh, one of them is actually a legitimate degree, Daniel, okay? So I'm not, I've got a couple of, I went to Moody right here in Chicago, okay? So we're not, we're not opposed to seminaries. I actually speak in them occasionally. I rarely get asked back a second time, but I do... I do speak in them occasionally, okay? But, but we would say the local church should be the seminary. Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says that Pastor Daniel's job and the leaders here of this church, their job is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. What we've done in the United States is we've kind of delegated the work of the ministry to our pastors, and that's not, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. The pastor is not to do the work of the ministry. The pastor is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Thus, the church becomes, uh, D.L. Moody once said, better to train 10 men to do the work than to try to do the work of 10 men or ladies. And he was a pretty smart guy. And so, and so that's the idea. We, we don't need, if the church is doing their job, we don't need the seminary for the most part. Okay? So you get rid of salary, sanctuary, seminaries. Guess what you've done? You've lowered the cost of church planting down to, well, let me put it this way, for every $1,000 you guys have sent, we've been able to start three churches in villages where there are no churches, where there's never been a church. And so it's just, it's, it's an incredible thing. You guys, uh, you've sent some money recently, but by the time it gets through the pike and the training's done, you guys, within just the next few months, 
will be responsible for having started, listen to this, 140 churches in 140 villages that have never had a church. One more thing, the, uh, yeah, you got the picture up there, good. I got to train myself not to look at that thing, but to look at this. Uh, what you're looking at, we've actually been mapping out, this is going in and out on me, Daniel, I think. Okay. So y'all can hear me okay? All right. Make sure you can hear me. I don't care if I hear myself or not. But what we've been doing in a couple of countries where we're investing your resources is sending people out and mapping the villages. We're finding out where there are churches, where there's not. On that map up there where you see yellow, that means we found Christians there but no churches. Where you see green villages, we found Christians and churches. Where you see red villages, we couldn't find not only were there no churches there, there were no Christians there. And what we've been doing is taking your funds and painting those red villages green. We've been going to villages where there's no churches, no Christians, and planting churches there. And so 140 of those red villages, let me tell you how many people, our churches are small. They're like rabbits. They're little, but they reproduce. They multiply. I don't know what this room is set up for here. Maybe, maybe 300 people or so. Maybe somewhere like that, 250, 300. Let me tell you how many people y'all have reached. Enough to fill up this building one time, two times, three times, four times, five times, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times from your investment that you've given so far. So that's a lot of people, a lot of people that you're going to see in heaven one day. Last statement on this. Each of these little churches are expected to significantly impact and take care of in some way either an orphan or a widow or a trafficked slave. They're everywhere. And so not only are you guys getting the gospel to thousands of people that would not have heard otherwise, but you're, you're changing the lives of little children and widows, people that no one else is going to care for. And I know that is dear to the heart of God. I want to thank you guys for what you've done. Uh, there is, uh, there's, two, there's two things that are greatly needed in our partnership, and that is the funding, which you guys are already doing. Again, for every $1,000 you raise, we can start three more churches. But the other thing we need is prayer. And I, I really want you to hear what I'm getting ready to say. Some of you are already on our prayer team. If... If, if you were to come up to me today and say, David, what do you need most? A million dollars or prayer? My response to you would be, can I please have both? <laughs> okay? But if you say, no, no, you can't have both, you got to choose. Ten years ago, I would have said, Write out the check. I'll find somebody that'll pray. I wouldn't say that today. Where we're working is in parts. Listen, yesterday I'm in a meeting with some pastors in Minneapolis and some elders. We get a text. One of the countries we're in, which by the way is one of the countries you're in, that we work, where we invest your funds. A young Timothy, a pastor or church planter, and his wife and his little children Yesterday, while we were in that meeting, a mob attacked them in the little village they were in and just beat, just beat the living daylights out of them. You say, what did they do? They were telling people about Jesus. Now, all the money in the world is not going to change that. There's a stronghold there. There's, there's incredible persecution. I could tell you, I, I could, if, if I didn't have to get to O'Hare Airport, I could tell you story after story after story all day long uh, the, where you're investing your money, people are having their houses burnt down. They're going to prison. It's illegal. They're going to prison. Uh, some are being killed. I'm going to show you some stories in just a minute. And all the money in the world is not going to change that. What we must have is prayer. I said that to say this. In the back, right back there by one of those tables, I've got some prayer cards I beg you, please, on your way out, it'll take 30 seconds. Just stop, 
fill out a card. You can't take it and leave. That won't do us any good. You've got to fill it out, drop it in the little basket there. And we will send you prayer requests about once a month, sometimes twice a month. It depends on what happens. It's all related to circumstance. Remember the coup in Myanmar a couple of, two or three weeks ago? We were, we were scheduled to start training 4,000 Timothys in Myanmar that week, and it all got shut down because of the coup. It, hundreds of people have been killed. Hundreds of people. Okay? And those are the kind of, th those are the parts of the world we're in. And so we're going to send you prayer requests. All we ask, this is not something where you've got to pray an hour or you don't have to pray and fast for 21 days. Okay? We're just asking you just to read it, pray, and then delete it. Don't ever post anything on social media. Just pray and delete, pray and delete. And if you'd be willing to do that, if you could just stop by, take a moment, and get the prayer request, uh, that, is, that is what we're asking you to do. And so thank you for your partnership. Last word, I think you're all aware your pastor is facing some, uh, some medical issues, some medical challenges. Uh, pastor Daniel, I've been praying for you. I'm going to keep praying for you. Uh, I love your pastor. He's real. Uh, he's, he's sincere. He's a good man. You guys have got a good shepherd. Amen? You do. A very good one. Thank you, Daniel. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of the solution. The solution. And I want to begin with some verses. Genesis 12 and verse 3. If you guys can get that one up on the screen for me. Genesis 12, verse 3. God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. Him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God is saying to Abraham, it's a prophecy about the coming of Jesus. He said, because uh, Jesus is going to be born as a son of Abraham, he's coming into this world to bless all the peoples, all the nations of this world. Look at the next verse, Psalm 67, verse 3. Let's move our way through the Bible. Let's leave Genesis. Let's get to Psalm 67. The psalmist said, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the people groups, the nations, praise you. Not just the Jews. Not just the Gentiles. Not just, uh, not just red or yellow or black or white. But the peoples, all the peoples, all the people groups, all the nations. Let them praise you. Let's leave the Psalms and move into the prophets. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. Isaiah records God saying, My house shall be called a house of prayer. We quote that part of the verse all the time, but we often leave out the last part of the verse. For all peoples. God's house is to be a house of prayer for all peoples. Let's move, leave the Old Testament, move forward into the New Testament. Luke chapter 24. This is right after Jesus was crucified, buried, rose from the grave. He's giving what we call the Great Commission in the book of Luke. Is that mic for me? All right, I had a feeling you were going to do that. Hello, everybody. Uh, all right, he should be good. All right, thank you. This, this guy's smarter than he looks, amen? Just a joke, just a joke. <laughs> Got to wake these people up here. Okay, this is uh, re right after the, oh, this is much better, thank you. Uh, this is right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and Jesus is giving what we call the Great Commission, and he says that he wants forgiveness of sins to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Do you see it there? Are you beginning to pick up a theme here? All families. All peoples, all nations. Let's go to the very last chapter, or the very last book of the Bible, Revelation 5 and verse 9. We're now in the throne room in heaven. Jesus is seated on that throne. There's a green rim, emerald rainbow around the throne and a sea of glass before it. And there are cherubim and seraphim just chanting, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands of saints from all, all the ages are on their faces before the throne, and they're singing that Thou Art Worthy song. And look where these people come from. They come from every tribe and language and people and nation. You picking up a theme here, ladies and gentlemen? 
These verses are just a handful that reveal God's heart. He wants the nations to know Him. I can't remember if I shared this with you before or not, but when I was a kid, not too far from here, northwest Indiana, about 18 years old, 19 years old, um, uh, a pastor challenged me to do something. He said, a lot of people read the Bible through once a year. He said, I challenge you to read it through twice every single year. And I took that challenge when I was 19 years old. I've read the Bible through twice a year, every year since I was 18, 19. I'm 67 years old, going on 68. I've read it a few times. I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm to 90-something. I'm asking for 100. If I get a couple more years, I'm going to make it. And sometimes when I'm reading the Bible through, I'll look for a certain theme and I'll, use, I'll, I'll pick a letter, and I'll, I'll put that letter by the verse. Once I was reading through the Bible in a six-month period, and I was looking for a theme of the nations, verses like you just read. And every time I came to a verse talking about the peoples of the world, the nations of the world, God's desire to see them come to know Him, I would put a little N in the column of my Bible. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. There are thousands they're everywhere. I knew it was in there, but I didn't know it was in there that much. I can open up that Bible to certain pages. When you look at the two pages open up, and there are some places where there's 15, 20, 25 ends just on two pages. Let me tell you something. For God so loved the world. Jesus shed his blood for the sins of the world. These verses and hundreds and hundreds of others like them reveal God's heart. He wants the nations to know Him, every people, every place. But there is an awful problem. Here's the problem. Most people do not know Him. And many people, many people have never even heard of Him. You see, this is hard for us to understand because you drove by 10 churches on your way to church this morning. But according to the Joshua Project, 41% of the world is classified as unreached, unreached people groups. Daniel, you've seen some of those areas. That means about 3 billion people, they've never driven by a single church on a single day in their life. For that matter, they've never driven. They don't have a car. But had they had a car, they never would have driven by a single church, a single... You drove by 10 on your way to church this morning. They've never driven by one in their entire life. You say, why not, David? Because there are none there. Out of the 7.5 billion people on the face of the earth, over 5 billion of them will tell you they are not a Christian. The other 2.5 billion would include everything that claims to be a Christian, all Protestants, all Catholics, all Orthodox, all cults. Jehovah's Witnesses would be in there. That's about two and a half billion people. Some of those do not know Christ, obviously, but let's set those aside. That still leaves five billion plus people on the face of the earth that will tell you, I am not a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me put it a little bit different perspective. Between right now and 11, 12 in the morning, tomorrow morning, in the next 24 hours, right at 155,000 people are going to die and go into eternity lost. The next day, another 155,000. The next day, another 155,000. Do you know how many people 155,000 is? Now, I Googled it this morning. If this is right, that's the entire population of Tinley Park, Homewood, Oak Forest, and Lansing, combined every single day dying and going into eternity lost. Of that group, about 60% of them will go into eternity lost having never heard about Jesus Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is an awful problem. The last time I checked, this was a firm, solid, Bible-believing Bible teaching church. Am I right on that? You guys, how many of y'all believe the Bible is the Word of God? Do you really believe it? Are you aware that the Bible teaches something that's not very popular to preach today? 
but I'm going to preach it anyway because I'm leaving town in about an hour. <laughs> Pastor Daniel can take care of the problems, okay? Uh, are you aware that the Bible says these words? In fact, red letter Jesus said these words. Came out of his mouth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one, no exceptions, no one comes to the Father except through me. Are you all aware the Bible says that? Are you all aware Jesus looked at Nicodemus one day, a very religious man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Jesus looked at Nicodemus, John 3, and said these words, Nicodemus, unless you get born again, you won't even see God's kingdom, much less enter it. Check it out, John 3, 3, John 3, 7. Except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Are you aware that Peter preached right after Pentecost there in Jerusalem? Peter said these words, Neither is there salvation found in any other name under heaven given among mankind except the name of Jesus Christ. What am I, you say, David, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ with no exceptions. I'm trying to tell you that the Bible also says that when you die, it only gives you two places you can go. The Bible says when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to a place that we refer to as hell or Hades. And ladies and gentlemen, there, there is no other place. When you die, you don't go to, I don't know, uh, uh, Wisconsin. When you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. And the only way you're going to heaven is through a personal relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who loved you, shed His blood on a cross, died, was buried, and rose again. That is not popular to say that today, but that is what the Bible teaches. How many of y'all are Bible believers again? Let me see your hand. Is that what the Bible teaches? That is what the Bible teaches. And so, if that's so, this is an awful problem. There's enough people that would totally fill up Tinley Park, Homewood, Oak Forest, Lansing every single day, every 24 hours that are dying, leaving this world, dying, and going into eternity lost. Going to a place the Bible calls hell. And what's really sad to me is, in many cases, it's not so much that they were rejecting Jesus. They don't know who he is. And the reason they don't know who he is, nobody ever told them. How many of you are glad somebody told you about Jesus? Question. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? I was in a country, your pastor's been there with me. We went to a little church service of the very first ever church for that entire ethnicity. This country is made up of 295 ethnicities. 95% of them are classified as unreached, very few Christians. 90% of the villages in this country just a few years ago had no churches. If you had looked at all the villages, they would have all been red instead of green. Very first church ever for this ethnicity. There's about 15, 20 people. They're seated on the floor. And, Daniel, that, that is, was one of the highlights of my life. Uh, you know, I've pastored a couple of mega churches. I'd take those 15 people on the floor in a heartbeat. Okay? First ever church for that entire people group. And they were singing some songs in the trade language, the, the major language of that country some praise songs, and I asked him, I said, can you sing me a praise song to Jesus in your mother tongue, in your language? And they kind of talked back and forth, and they looked back at me through an interpreter and said, no, we cannot do that, Dr. David. And I asked, why can't you? And their response was, there are no songs 
in our language written to Jesus. Question, has anybody in this room ever written a song? Can I see your hand? Anybody at all? I know you have. One, put, put them up good and high. You have a talented church here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Man, this is a musical seven, eight, nine. Daniel, you wrote a song? All right. Why am I surprised? Nine people in this room have written songs. This is an entire ethnicity that's never had at least a Christian song, a praise song to Jesus written. You say, why? Don't, aren't they musical? Yeah, they're very musical. They didn't know about Jesus. Nobody had ever told them. The very next day, I'm in another church, one of our other churches, maybe a year or two old, and a young man, about 20 years old, stood up, and here was his testimony. He said, I lived up in the mountains. I came down from the mountains to the big city here to get a job. And he said, as soon as I got to town, I was out on the street, and one of you found me, and you started telling me about Jesus. He said, I never heard about Jesus. He said, I accepted Jesus. He said, last week I got baptized, and he said, I'm here, I'm, I'm now telling you, I'm standing to give this testimony. I decided I'm going to go back to the mountains. I'm going to go back to my village. He said, forget the job. I'm going back home because my people have never heard about Jesus. He said, my parents are still living. I got brothers there. I got sisters. I got aunts. I got uncles. I got cousins. Every person I've ever known in my entire life, they live in that village, and nobody has ever heard about Jesus there. He said, they're all lost. They're all going to die. They're all going to perish without Jesus unless somebody goes back. Forget the job. I'm going to go back and tell my people about Jesus Christ. Oh, my goodness. I was in another country just before COVID hit, just a couple of months before COVID, and I, it was a Buddhist country, and I got to the hotel, and I checked in, and I went downstairs to the restaurant. I was hungry. That's half my problem. I'm always hungry. And I went to the restaurant. I was the only one in there. Americans eat a lot earlier than most people in the world. I went to that restaurant, and I, I sat down, and I was the only one in there. The waitress came over. Her name was Nan Wee. And she spoke broken English, and she, she said, uh, where are you from? I said, the States. And I had my fingers crossed that she started asking the right questions. And she said, well, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, I thought, yes, she asked me. I said, I'm a pastor. And she replied, what's a pastor? I knew she was going to ask me that. What's a pastor? I said, a pastor is a guy that works at a church. Her next question was, What's a church? I said, a church is a place where the pastor teaches people out of a book called the Bible. She then asked, what's a Bible? I said, the Bible is a, the holy book written. It records the message that came out of the mouth of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who made you and the one who made me. And in his message, he tells all of, all of the human race how we can know him, have a relationship with him through his son whom he sent to this earth to die for us. And he will not only forgive our sins and take away the shame and the guilt and put our broken lives back together, but one day we get to leave this world and live with him in his house. And in his house, there's no sorrow and there's no suffering. There's no pain and there's no more tears. And her eyes got real big and she asked, do you have one of these Bibles? Can I see it? This is just like a couple of months before COVID. About that time, a buddy of mine walked in, and he, he's the best personal evangelist I've ever seen. And I said, Dave, let me introduce you to Nan Wee. She has never seen a Bible. Can you show her your Bible? I knew he had the Bible.is app on his phone. If you don't have it, you ought to get it. It's got the Bible in over a 1,000 languages. So when some Uber driver picks you up, you can... You can play the Bible in their language form. But anyway, I didn't have my, Bible, my phone with me. I said, Dave, Nan Wee's never seen the Bible. Can you show her the Bible? Wink, wink. And so he clicked on Bible.is. He went to the Burmese language. He clicked on that. He then went to John. He went to John 3, and it's an audio also. So he clicked on the audio button. And for the first time in her life, she is hearing the Word of God in her own language I watched as she reached out. She didn't even ask. She just reached out, took the Bible out of Dave's hand, and began to scroll down. She listened to the entire chapter, all 36 verses. When she got done, Dave talked to her for a few minutes and led her to Jesus Christ. That was about 7.30, 7.45 in the, morning, in the evening. 7.45 in the evening. 
Sometimes I have problems sleeping, especially a different bed every night, and I'm tossing and turning and jet lag, and it was about 1.30 in the morning, and I thought, I'm not going to do this any longer. I'm going to go down in the lobby, make myself useful, see if I can find somebody that speaks English and try to talk to them about Jesus. It had been 7.45 to now 1.30. That's 8.45, 9, 10, 11, 12. About six hours had gone by. Everybody was in bed, but I found four staff downstairs that spoke English. I tried sharing Christ with those four staff. All four of them, Nan, we, had already talked to about Jesus Christ. All four of them. The next morning, we got up early to leave, and Nan Wee is standing there. It was her day off, but she came in anyway. She, she said to Dave and I, she said, I went home, and I told my sister about Jesus. She said, my sister is hungry. My sister wants to hear more about Jesus. And so we sent a Timothy there to, to work with her. And then Nan Wee looked at us, and with tears in her eyes, she said these words. She said, for the first time in my life, I feel pure. I feel pure. We crossed the street. There was a river there. We got in a Burmese uh, dugout. There are these narrow, real long boats, an engine on the back. It pops up, and you take off out in the middle of this lake. We had a, uh, there's a, uh, 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 villages built on stilts out in the middle of the water. You, you have to take a boat to get there. And we have, uh, we have churches that we built out there in those little villages. We went into one village. And about 40 people are there, all from one family. The houses are pretty big. One of the Timothys, young lady, had led 25 of her family members, all Buddhists, to Jesus Christ. One little 16-year-old girl stood up and gave a testimony. Here's what she said. She pointed to the Timothy and said, before she told me about Jesus, she said, I had never heard that name in my entire life. An old guy about my age stood up to sing a song he had written to Jesus, a praise song. Turns out he was the, the, the mayor or the chief of the little village. He had only been a believer for three months, and he had written a praise song to Jesus Christ, and he wanted to sing it. I can tell you these stories all day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an awful problem. People that God created, people that Jesus loves, people that Jesus died for, they are born and they live and they die and they go into eternity never even having heard about Jesus Christ. And if they've heard the name Jesus, they've heard the name Jesus like, like we Americans have heard the name uh, Krishna or Ram or Ganesh or some Hindu deity. We maybe have heard the name, but we have no idea who they are. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an awful problem because if the Bible is true and you just told me you believe it is, the wrath of God awaits these people. Oh, my goodness. And by the way, don't even get me started on the United States. We are lost. So what's the solution? I think i got three minutes left. The solution is obviously Jesus. He's the answer to every question. He's the solution to every problem. But according to 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20, the solution is also you. Look at it there. God's reconciling the world, there it is again, to himself, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. Stop right there. We talk about our identity in Christ. You know what your identity in Christ is? You're an ambassador. You're not an embassy worker. This building is the embassy. Somebody needs to make sure the mics are on. Somebody needs to run the slides. Somebody needs to do all this other stuff. And that's good. And we are we have jobs to do here just like we have at home. But you are more than an embassy worker. You are ambassadors. You represent the king of glory out in the real world. We are ambassadors. And God has entrusted to us. Notice it's more than a command. It's a trust. 
In just a moment, Daniel and Miss Ruth are going to drive me up to O'Hare. At least that's what they told me. <laughs> I'm trusting them because my wife misses me very much. If I'm just daydreaming, not paying attention, and all of a sudden we pull up in front of Midway instead of O'Hare, I'm going to really be irritated. And I'm going to say, Daniel, I trusted you. I don't know if God ever gets irritated with us. I know he loves us. I know if I were God, I'd be irritated all the time. Okay? I don't know if God ever gets irritated with us, but I, know, I do know this. God is trusting you to tell the world that they can be reconciled. Do you know what that word reconciled means? It means brought back into a righteous relationship with God. Here's God in His holiness. Adam and Eve sinned. They fell away from God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. They deserve to die and go to hell. God had mercy. He said, I'm going to provide a way where you can be brought back into a right and righteous relationship with me. And he did it through the shed blood of his holy, holy, holy son, Jesus Christ. And then, get this, God says, I am giving to you, Woodlands, the privilege, the honor of telling the world that message. Can somebody say amen? You say, David, how do we do it? My time's gone, but three ways. Through your generosity. You guys are doing that. You're getting ready to redo this building a little bit. It's going to cost some money. May I make a suggestion? Whatever you are going to give, put a zero on the end of it. What's more important than what's happening in this room right here? I can't think of anything. I mean, this is, this is better than the Cubs, amen? Of course, that's not saying a whole lot, but this is, uh, this is really important, what you guys are doing here, through, through our generosity. You know, I was thinking about the other day, Daniel, 45 years I've been preaching, and I do look like it, 45 years I've been preaching. Over the years, I've had tons of people come to me and say, hey, can we have longer time to sing and worship? Can we have more worship time? I've had some people come up and say, can you cut out the music and have more preaching time? I think in 45 years, I've had two people ask me that. Okay, maybe two. One of those was my mother. All right. But you know what I've never had? I've never had a single time in my life anybody walk through the front door and say, Pastor, I had this check for the church all week. I can't wait to give it. Can we just skip the preaching? Can we just skip the uh, music? Can we just get right to the offering? I can't wait. I've never had anybody say that to me. I've had them say, can we sing longer? Can you preach longer? I've never had anybody say, can we just skip all that stuff and get right to the giving? Amen. What's wrong with us? How are we going to, what is the solution? We're the solution. Jesus changes the world through us. How are we going to get the gospel? We got, we got to give. We have to give. And, and what else? We've got to obey. The Great Commission is go make disciples. And there's no please in that verse. It's not a request. He's not asking us. He's telling us, go make disciples. Are you making disciples? You either are or you aren't. It's not, it's not an option. It's a command. We must be obedient. You say, David, I don't know how to make disciples. Well, I got good news for you. You got a guy right down here who can help you. Grab him. Say, train me. Teach me. Amen. And finally, we do it through our prayers. We do it through our prayers. Can I just show you one picture? I know I'm a little over time, but just uh, skip on down. Ne next picture. Next picture right there. That'll be a good. Let's just go to Genty. Just back up there one if you would. This little gal, uh, she was a little younger when the story happened that I'm about to tell you. But she was in a little village, a little Hindu village. 
And a Timothy came in and preached the gospel. And about 25 or 30 people responded to the Lord. And the rest of the village got very upset. And they had a big meeting. And they brought the little believers in. And the, they had, the, the village leaders had gotten together and written up a document. Basically, the gist of the document was uh, renounce Jesus and come back to the gods and goddesses to worshiping them or you're in trouble. And everybody's yelling and screaming and angry. It's a mob. And one by one, the new believers walked up and they began signing the document, signing their name. Forget Jesus, I worship the gods and goddesses. Genty's mother, it came her time, she was standing there in line with Genty. And the mother stepped forward and she leaned over and she wrote on the document. She went back and stood by Genty and the village leader looked at it and rather than signing her name she had drawn a cross they grabbed her mother and they began beating her and they beat her and they beat her and they beat her and they threw her on the ground and they kicked her and they beat her and they kicked her some more and they beat her some more and they beat her to death there was another little church that we'd started in the neighboring village just a 15, 20 minute walk away and that church took Genty and brought her in as, as an orphan and took care of her. That is why I'm asking you to pray. I can repeat that story many, many times. And every time I look at that picture, I think of the words of that old gospel song, Must I be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. We have been given so much. To whom much is given, much is required. It's a big lost world. That's a problem. For you who are saved, you got a ticket to heaven. And you can't lose it because we're Baptists, right? Baptists have eternal security. So you're set. But most of the world is not. God wants them to hear the good news too. It's going to be their choice to accept or reject, but at least they ought to hear it. And God's plan for them to hear it is through you. You are the solution. To you has been entrusted the message of reconciliation. You say, David, I'm just one little person in, in, in a Homewood or Homestead or wherever this place is. I'm just one little person. What can I do? I just told you what you can do. You can give. You can be obedient and make disciple makers. And you can pray. My challenge to you this morning is to do just that. Be the solution God saved you to be. And all God's people said, and Pastor Daniel, last statement, if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, Jesus is your solution. You need Jesus, just like I need Jesus. And the really good news for you is you can meet him today, this very day. You can be introduced to Jesus Christ, have him come to live within your heart, your life, and he will change your life forever. What a great honor it is to be your partner. I thank you. I thank God for you. Pastor Daniel, I turn the service over to you. God bless you folks. Stay here. Hey, David, stay here. David, stay here, please, if you would. Um, elders out there, run up here real quick, will you? Come on, hurry. Mike, Richard, Lamont, Dar Darwin, where's Ray? Ray? Ray work? Okay, come on down. David, would like you to stand right here, if you would? Everybody else, I invite you to stand up. You've been sitting for a while. All right, guys. Let's uh, put our hands on uh, David. All right. And uh, let's, uh, out in the audience, lift your hands up towards uh, Dr. David, please. We're going to pray for him in the ministry of TT. He wants us to pray. By golly, we're going to pray. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for our brother, David Nelms. Father, uh, we pray for him representing the entire Timothy Initiative uh, uh, leadership and all of the Pauls, all of the Timothys, all of the Tituses, 
all of the, the new believers, Father, um, and uh, it, it, uh, David, is it, what, how many new believers in the last, are we over a million yet? Uh, almost two. Almost two million. The almost two million new believers, Father, who have uh, come to you through the Timothy Initiative. Uh, Father, we're so thankful over 91,000 churches planted, Lord. And God, we are so thankful and so humbled, Father, that we've been a part of 140 of them. Um, but God, that's not near enough. We want to do a lot more here at Woodlands. And so, Father, I pray for Dr. David. I pray for his wife, Lorraine. God, I pray for his children. God, I pray that for his health. May you, may you physically take care of him. May you physically bless him and encourage him. Father, I pray for all of those um, uh, believers who are in hostile villages, which is probably most of them. God, I pray... Oh, Lord, I pray. Father, we Americans, we always want to pray that you'll protect them. God, we always want to pray that you will rescue them. And yet, God, so many of those, when they hear that we're praying like that for them, they're like, why? Because they would gladly give their lives for Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray, uh, like those words in Revelation eleven twelve, 12, um, that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Lord, may these new believers overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And Lord, uh, that verse goes on to say, they did not love their life so much as to shrink back from death. So God, I pray for them, Father. Um, the, 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 the Geminis and, and, and all the others, Lord, who have looked at death, Father, and have had loved ones who have died, empower them and strengthen them. Father God, send out these Pauls and these Timothys and Tituses into the villages. God, send the money from the people who have the money. Father, I pray, not just, Lord, I pray for multiple partnerships, Father, here in Chicago area. Lord, I pray that you would help us to connect with other people, business people, who can write those checks and put an extra zero behind it. Um, God, because every $300 plants a church. God, we, when we send missionaries from America, it takes about $100,000 just to get them to where they're going. And, and, and that doesn't guarantee anybody getting saved. Um, and God, I know it's not wrong. We need some of those people. We really do. But God, mostly we need what the Timothy Initiative is doing. So God, I pray your blessing. I pray your anointing. I pray that you will cover them with the blood of the Lamb of Jesus. I pray that you will surround them with your holy angels. I pray that your Holy Spirit will fill them up to overflowing, Father, so that every person connected with the Timothy Initiative, God, I pray for every person connected with Woodlands Community Church, that we will be of one heart and one mind. And God, that together we will speak up and speak out and be ambassadors for you, Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And we will not love our lives or our reputation so much that we would shrink back from death or shrink back from fearing that we would be rejected or shrink back from fearing that we don't have the right words or shrink back from fearing that someone might not want to be our friend on Facebook anymore. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to have uh, Dr. Nelms. He's going to be back at this table. Get him just a minute. Um, David, if you want to go ahead and head on back there. Um, guys, uh, you all can head on back there too. And uh, we are done for today. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you all for watching online. This, guys... This day is going to mark a day in the history of Woodlands. All right? We are not going to be part of the 95 to 97 percent of Christians who go to heaven without sharing their faith with one person. That will not be us. We are Woodlands Community Church, and we take the gospel to Homewood, Flossmore, Illinois, the United States, and the world. Amen? All right. Have a great day. Bye now. Yeah.